my favorite now that it tells us that we're recording. I know. <laughs> anyway, welcome in Megan Abbott to this complete performance team group training session. Megan and I, we, we connected on the podcast about a lot of things, functional fitness, the way we approach training and nutrition. And I wanted to bring you into this group to talk to my clients a little bit more about this whole idea of functional training and functional nutrition. So any introduction you want to give to yourself before we dive into some questions here? Yeah, just kind of qualifications. Um, so I'm Megan Abbott. Um, I'm a certified personal trainer. I have several specialties underneath that as well. Um, and then I'm also a nutritional therapy practitioner, which means I'm a holistic nutritionist. Um, so I, I take things, everything from a very holistic perspective, looking for root cause. Um, and I specialize in working with people who have chronic pain and fixing it. Cool. I love that. I think I did. I almost forgot the holistic background and that I have my holistic health masters and you're a holistic nutrition coach. And I think that's uh, another area of how we really, and why we really saw eye to eye on this. So a big area, what you mentioned right from the get-go is chronic pain. So what to you is what's the definition of chronic pain? Yeah. So chronic pain, very loose definition is a pain that is either consistent or often on consistently for about three months or longer. Um, you know, sometimes it's more six months if it's more often on, but that three month mark, if you're not feeling better and you've been kind of working at it, it, it is now a consistent chronic pain. And I think sometimes when it comes to aches and pains, I know I'm guilty of it. You kind of forget how long that it's been there, like in the moment. So I'm just recovering from a neck injury. And like, you could have asked me three days after, and I would have swore this neck pain had been around for months. Um, <laughs> but now, like now I forget, I'm like, wow, it's been like six weeks since I hurt my neck. Like that's racking up some time. Um, I think that that it goes very quickly that three month mark like it comes before you know it. And if your knee, your back, your hip, your shoulder has been bothering you that long, I mean, it's probably time to do something about it. It's a long time. I mean, our bodies are really smart and really good at healing and, and performing and adjusting. And if you have that pain, I, I mean, three months is a long time, I, you know, even I, sometimes it's shorter than that, but and it doesn't have to be like a sharp, like consistent pain. You know, you wake up and your back's a little achy every day for three months. You have chronic pain. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you think you put it in terms of like a, a year span. It's a, it's a quarter of a year. Yeah. I mean, you think of like, you're for sure going to have to go to some holiday events, probably like some birthdays, work functions, all of those things in pain mm -hmm. that would just, that would drive me nuts. Yeah. It's, it's not fun having been there for many years. It's, it's not yeah. fun. And it's, it takes over your life in more ways than you realize in the moment. For sure. So working with individuals with chronic pain, it's a lot about mindset, a lot about mindset. So how do you approach that with clients? Maybe help them see that, Hey, that pain has been bothering you for three months or just the whole, the whole process of approaching it. Yeah. So when I think mindset, I think kind of two different aspects of mindset. So the first aspect is really a lot of more of the psychological aspect. So things that happen when we have chronic pain, anxiety, depression, irritability, some of these things that can slowly kind of creep on and a lot of people deal with normally, but then are exacerbated by chronic pain. If you have chronic pain, if try living in pain for a week, you're going to be a little irritable, have some anxiety about moving and doing certain things, you know, picking something up, doing some everyday motions that you're so accustomed to doing Then all of a sudden there's this like, Oh, I better take a second. Like, can I actually do this? Is this going to hurt? And that really compounds over several months, several years, several decades and makes a really big impact. And there's also this kind of deep depression that people can fall into. I, I mean, chronic pain ruins your life. It, it takes over every aspect from, you know, your ability to work out, your ability to do everyday things, to work, to have a social life, to go to events, you know, all of these things. So there's this kind of psychological aspect of, you know, be understanding that you are in pain and it's okay to feel this way. And 
a lot of people will talk about their pain at first, you know, oh yeah, I hurt my back, hurt my shoulder. But after a while, people stop talking about it because their loved ones, friends, family, either they get tired of hearing about it, or you now feel like a burden talking about it to these other people. Right. And holding that pain in, that physical, emotional, psychological pain, that takes a huge burden on your life, on your mindset, how you approach everything from relationships to work, your social, I mean, everything. So there's that piece. Then there's also the piece of being in pain and then trying to get out of that pain. And, and there's a, a very real fear uh, and protection of the body that is, is physical, but it's also emotional and psychological as well of, you know, if I do this movement that is supposedly supposed to help me, but it doesn't feel great in the moment, can I actually do it? Is it, is it something that I can actually do progressions through these movements, whether that's in physical therapy with a coach, you know, whoever it is, like, can I actually progress through this? And then, you know, a lot of times when I'm working with clients, we start at the bottom and work our way up. There's other things that come to light just because you have one pain doesn't mean you don't have other pain that's being masked by this first pain. And there's a, a a really big fear, you know, all, you know, you have knee pain and then all of a sudden your lower back hurts and, and it's like, oh my God, am I going to be in pain forever? Is my body just falling apart? And, you know, some of these people are really young and it's like, I'm 30 and I'm broken. It's like, what is 50 or 60 going to look like? And so there, there's this like real fear and, and we hold on to it. And so a lot of it is one, being able to talk about your pain. And so I, like I said, people tend to hold on to it and not talk about it. So I, one of the big things I do is just give people space to talk about it. I want to hear about it. I want to know all the things that you've struggled with, that you've been dealing with. If you need to cry, like, let's just cry for an hour. Like that is part of the healing process. Yeah. And, and then learning how to talk about your pain and, you know, for the average person, this is very, very difficult with athletes. It tends to be a little bit easier. And with athletes, you have typically have to pull a little bit because they're used to working through more pain and injuries and certain things like, no, 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 that's normal. Like it's fine. I can push through it. My bone, my bone is sticking out. Things are fine. It's fine. Exactly. Exactly. But for the average person, we're so, we get so disconnected from our bodies and you know, what does a muscle burning feel like versus you know, a bad, like pulling pain, stabbing, you know, what does that pain feel like and learning how to connect with your body and identify what this pain is and knowing that some pains are okay and some are not okay. And, and being able to realize that distinction between the two. I think it's, I, I really love the diff, like n- losing touch with the muscle burning, like, oh, I'm like, getting a really good pump in this workout and actual like, Ooh, this is like straining. I will never forget. This is none of my clients in this group, but I did have a client who her calves hurt so bad. We had done like calf raises or something. And she was convinced that like something was very, very wrong. She felt so much burning during it. So she did all this research. She sent me all of this research about how she had micro tears in her, in her legs. And I was like, congrats. Like you just built stronger calves. And I'm like, she is so like, I can't work out. This is like, this is really bad. I'm like, at that point there was, there was no convincing her. I mean, she was, she was set in like, she is injured. She needs to back away from this, but it's true. Like I have been an athlete my whole life. I am very, I'm very tactile in nature as well. So I'm pretty bodily aware. Um, so I'm definitely the, like, yeah, you got to peel back a layer. Um, I went to work the, I hurt my neck on my way to work and, uh, I got there and one of my clients, I was laying on the floor she's like, do I need to call the ambulance? And I was like, I'm not sure. Um, but it, you know, like it's really easy to lose touch with things, but then to also feel at the same time, you're falling apart. Like, Oh, this hurts. That hurts. This hurts. That hurts. So to my two clients who told me today that they are falling apart, like it's, it's okay to a degree. However, like we also like have to find out like 
what it's coming from, where it is. And like, I don't mean like how real is this pain, but like, is it a muscle burning pain? Cause we're like burning out your booty here. Or is it a, Hey, I think I might actually have a low back problem. That's causing some pain here. So. And it's a hard distinction. It takes mm-hmm. some time to figure that out. And the, uh, you know, one of the big values I see in working with a coach in this process is having someone who has that experience of this is good. This is bad. We can work through this. We should not work through this. Here's what you should do now. Now that we felt this, here's how I want you to recover because that's a huge piece of the puzzle too. And having this process laid out and, and that coach is so invaluable. I, I mean, just it's priceless. Yeah. I think, I think that coaches do become they're, they're easy sounding boards. Like I, as you were talking about people needing to talk about their pain, I was like, wow, I, I really do feel like my clients share this hurts, this aches, which is great because like, to me, that's a, a, an affirmation as a coach that I've created that, that space for that conversation. But that's also really like, I don't realize because they do, they do tell me so much that they probably have nobody else in their life to really talk about this too, because their back always hurts, their hip always hurts. And they don't, they don't want to be the burden. Um, we're, I mean, we're in Minnesota, so we have the traditional Minnesota nice is kind of our thing. And you don't ever want to burden somebody. It's, I mean, athlete or not, you have to have something like you have to be like gushing blood or something for you to say something. But I really didn't even realize that for, for my clients, which is cool. And also terrifying as well. Right. <laughs> and when you're a coach for so long, I, you know, I, at, one point I just realized like when I, my first meeting with someone, I learned more about them than probably most of their closest friends know. I know. In their first meeting. Yeah. Like I've had, like, I think of like calls, like introductory calls with clients. I've had multiple occasions where they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm telling you all this. Oh, I might be sharing too much with you. And you're like, good. It's good. You clearly needed to get it off your chest. And there, to me, there's, there's always value in, if you're telling it to me, it's important to you. Therefore we got to listen. Exactly. So let's shift gears a little bit. I want to talk autoimmune diseases. I know you were really excited to talk about this. I was really excited to ask questions about this. I know this can piggyback or be tied right to chronic pain. How do you approach this belief that you can't do certain things or you have to live a certain way because of your autoimmune condition? Yeah. So I, I think when we're talking about autoimmunity, we really need to, to figure out what autoimmunity is. And I think just looking at the basis of your body has a strong inflammatory process and your body is now attacking itself in a certain way. And depending on what the autoimmune condition is, your body's attacking your thyroid, you know, your nerves, your bone, I mean, whatever it is, your body's attacking itself. And I I think that a big piece of, of Western medicine sometimes with autoimmunity is autoimmunity isn't just one thing. It's not just genetic. It's not just inflammation. It's not just one thing. It is all of these things combined. And so, you know, I like to use myself as an example. So I was in amazing shape, best shape of my life. I had a a very demanding job, very stress-driven, wasn't sleeping a ton, but was getting decent stress, but was training two a days and it, you know, I had some trauma I hadn't quite dealt with. And then all of a sudden I'm in this very minor car accident and my body shuts down a hundred percent chronic lower back pain, like debilitated, debilitating lower back pain all of these sudden chronic issues that no one can identify, all of these things spent two years in the Western medicine world. No one could fix me, no one could get rid of this pain, but no one also had looked at some of these chronic things, these other pieces of the puzzle of chronic stress, inflammatory foods that I was eating very healthy, but in a healthy and a traditional Western sense. Yeah. And, you know, this undiagnosed trauma that I had dealt with, which is a huge piece of it. Yes, there is a genetic component to it. There was a trauma, minor or not, it was still a trauma all of a sudden. And you just put all all of these things together. And so when we think about autoimmunity, we have to look at all of those things. We can't 
just look at your chronic pain. We just can't look inside at your inflammation. We can't, we have to look at everything. And so when it comes to autoimmune conditions, autoimmune conditions can be put into remission, but it takes a very holistic approach to this. And I will say chronic pain is in large part the exact same way. It is not just a structural thing. It's not just an inflammatory thing. It's not just one thing. It's many, many things combined. And so autoimmunity can be put into remission. You're not doomed to deal with it, but at the same time, you have to make a lot of changes in your life oftentimes because of how you got there. So you know, for, I, I work with a lot of people who have autoimmune conditions of varying sorts, and some people choose just to take medicine for it and deal with their flare-ups that happen very regularly that take them out. Other people take a more holistic approach and almost never have flare-ups. I mean, go years without any issues. And, and so it's really a matter of what are you willing to do to not have flare-ups? Are you willing to change your nutrition and give up some of the things that you may have loved in the past? You know, gluten, dairy, processed oils, you know, nightshades, depending on the autoimmune condition and the person. Are you willing to give up your high stress workouts? Focus on your sleep, focus on detoxification of your body, get you know, take a deeper look inside what's going on. Do we have heavy metals? Do we have mineral imbalances? Do, you know, what does our gut look like? You know, what is our thyroid? You know, all of these things, what does everything look like and attack it that way? And then also deal with the trauma because there's gonna, um, I have yet to meet a person with an autoimmune condition doesn't, that doesn't have some sort of trauma that either triggered it or has childhood into early adult trauma. Yeah. I, so to me, it sounds like, like if you're just your average Joe or Jill trying to lose body fat and you like, you have to make lifestyle changes in order to see those body composition results, very similar for chronic pain and for autoimmune, Mm -hmm. it, it might just be bigger lifestyle changes. And it's just like with working out with eating, right. With, you know, when you want to lose body fat, you have to make that choice. Do I want to you know, be a little bit more rigid right now. So I get to my goal a little bit faster, or do I want to really do this in a lifestyle way where like, I still have pizza on Friday nights or, you know, do those things that I enjoy, have a glass of wine every few nights. If I want to results may come a little bit slower, but you always can eat. Like you teach yourself how to live this long-term. Um, and I think like, it sounds like chronic pain, autoimmune, it's never going away. I mean, you're going to, you, you have it, but we just have to make lifestyle changes or choose the route of medication and you've got to be consistent with it. It's just like you go on, like you, you're going on vacation next week. If you went on vacation for like three weeks and didn't care about a single thing you ate with your body at all, we're going to see some changes in body composition. You're not going to come back the same. (laughs) It like, it's fact of the matter. If you ate pizza and burgers and fries and wings and sat on the couch, or maybe if you're, I don't know, are you going to a beach? No. Oh, well, never mind. If you sat yeah. around, <laughs> you know, if you sat around and did nothing all week, you'd feel pretty uncomfortable when you came back. But yeah, yeah I think, um, I think that's a really good way to frame it too. It's like, you owe it, you have to constantly be working with it. You're not always necessarily working through it, but you're working with it. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's the same thing as, as losing body fat. You know, you have to make some temporary, sometimes stricter changes, but long-term, you know, for me, I can eat foods that I never thought I'd be able to eat again. Now I can't eat them every day, but I can have them once in a while. And I do just fine with them. I can do certain things that, you know, a couple years ago I couldn't ever do, but now in moderation, I can definitely do it. Right. But yeah. you have to make those temporary, sometimes a little bit more strict sacrifices. Right. It's, I mean, it's almost like, I mean, you're in, you do the NCI stuff as well. It's like you have seasons, um, seasons of dieting, seasons of training. You're going to have seasons maybe where a flare up is a, like, it seems to be more because maybe work's a little bit more stressful and you're more at risk. So you got to be a little bit more rigid with your diet to balance that out. Mm-hmm. You may be able like life is pretty stress-free right now. You can maybe be a little bit more lax in other areas. Exactly. Yeah. 
Cool. I love, I love that perspective on, on autoimmune. So let's talk, what are some real or actual limitations with chronic pain or autoimmune conditions? Everyone is different and you have to understand you are different than your friend who is going to recommend things to you. The one friend who, you know, oh, you should follow this person on Instagram. Oh, you should try this diet. Oh, you should try this form of exercise. You are different. You are different than most other people. And so you have to listen to your body. Our bodies are so smart and they're so good at giving us signs, but we have to, one, we have to listen. And two, we have to, when our bodies are telling us something, we have to figure out what our body needs in that moment. And the body is going to tell you, but we have to really learn and be open to listening to it. And if we are moving all the time, high stress, not sleeping, you know, so disconnected from our bodies, we're not going to be able to realize what those signs and symptoms are of what our body needs at that time. And so limitations, you know, typically we're going to have some long-term nutritional changes we have to make, you know, there's probably going to be foods that we cannot eat ever or there's gonna be real consequences. You may have limitations on the types of exercises you can do regularly. That doesn't mean every once in a while, but really high stress workouts, you know, traditional HIIT style workouts, probably not the best for you. CrossFit is probably not in your future anymore. Sorry, not sorry. Let's be real here. Yes. You know, sleep is probably going to have to be a real priority. Recovery is going to have to be a real priority. And once again, we have to listen to our bodies. I will say most people in this place, and, and I am that same way, we can't work out five or six days a week like we used to. I get three, four if I'm really lucky on a good week. Otherwise, I start to go into flare ups just like most other people. And so it's understanding that you, if you want to feel good, you have to put that first. And knowing that you can't do necessarily what you did 10, 15 years ago, you can't necessarily always look the same way that you did 10 to 15 years ago. It doesn't mean you can't look good, but if you want to feel good and be able to train and, and do all these things that you love, you have to put your health first. Yeah. I think I love that you bring up that you, like your body's a great communicator. You just have to listen. That's, I mean, that's step number one, then it's finding what it needs because just because it sends this certain message, there's no like right answer. I think of it like a multiple choice question where it's like, choose all that apply. And you're like, you got to pick out the best one. It could be multiple. And I think it's, I mean, it's very individualized and with the way that a lot of it goes and you have to be okay with that. I love that you said at the beginning, it's not what works for your friend. It's not what works for your sister, your brother, your mother, whoever it is, it, it works for you. Yeah. Um, because that is, so, and that's great. Like I, I love using your resources. If you have somebody that, you know, let's say like you're, you're one of Lee's Hashi girls and like you learn something in her Hashi's group about, Hey, this really works for me. And you're like, you know what? Like, if you think it might work for you, try it. But if you're like, you know what I've eaten, I don't know, gluten, I've eaten gluten for my entire life and it doesn't seem to be the issue. Like it might not be the issue. There's probably something else that's there with it. Yeah, exactly. And it's, we just, I feel like we get so caught up and in like, oh, it works for this person. Oh, there's this thing. There's, you know, this diet and this type of workout. And you're constantly bouncing between all of these things. You know, every couple of weeks you're changing and changing and changing. These things also take time. You know, our most I've been on, God, I, I mean, I was on elimination diets for about three years straight. You have to give these things time. Some are one month, most of them, you need a little bit more than a month to, to do these. And it's, you know, figuring out, you can't just keep bouncing around. And yeah, I like taking things from different types of diets, but experimenting is good, but also being patient and giving yourself time. Yes. With these things. Yeah. I, um, 
at the beginning of the year, I actually, I tried the vertical diet because I was thinking that I was having, I mean, I, I don't like, I, I don't love red meter fish. I'm trying to like them a little bit more. Um, so I'm pretty strictly turkey and chicken. And I was like, I'm having a lot of gut issues. I'm wondering if it could actually be the turkey or the chicken. So I was like, you know what? Vertical diet could be a, a great option to shift away from that. And I had to do it for, I did it for three months. Um, you know, probably the last month is when I started to incorporate a few more things, but it takes time. I couldn't tell you there was a difference in the first two weeks of things no, because I had no clue. I really didn't feel any different. And it's very natural to be like, all right, like I'm waiting here. Like, <laughs> I'm trying this steak and salmon and I'm trying to feel better, but I'm waiting, I'm waiting. <laughs> Once again, this is where I see a lot of value in coaches because I did this for a long time too, where I was like, oh, let me try this. Oh, let me try this. Oh, let me try this. And it's like, I need someone to pull me back and be like, no, this is the path we're doing. We're sticking with this. We'll just what we need to, but we have to give it time. You have to be patient with it. Yes. I think the other really important thing that I want to make sure we like readdress here is that you have to decide if your goal is to feel good right now, your goal is not to lose body fat right now. They're two very, very different things. If your goal is to feel good right now, it's not to be like making huge strides in your training program. It's you, your primary focus. And I, it's, I empathize with individuals with chronic pain, with autoimmune who are like, Oh, I just want to lose weight, but I also want to feel better. It's like, it is a very, very difficult decision to make because you feel this pressure to look a certain way. You want to make those changes, but I'm like, why not like stop the ickiness, stop feeling icky and then try that. Um, and I get like some people want to do one before the other, but you have to make that decision and stick with that because that also takes time. So I'm doing a series right now in my, my Facebook group, all about how to lose weight with chronic pain. And yeah. And one of the big things that I really emphasize again and again is if your health is optimal, I'm not talking just good, but optimal and you are overweight, you are naturally going to lose body fat because our bodies want to be healthy and being, you know, overweight. And I'm talking like pretty overweight. I'm not talking like just you have a couple extra pounds on you that doesn't feel good for our bodies in a healthy state. And, and so these two things really go hand in hand. And I come from a, a, my early years was in bodybuilding and these people are like the ultimate, you know, aesthetic appeal. They're some of the unhealthiest people and they pay for it later on, whether that's shortly after a show or several years later. I mean, I come from a world of powerlifting where it's like not aesthetics, but performance is so valued, but you pay for it later. So many of these people pay immediately following a meet or years later because bodies were not, were not taken care of. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's like, that is very, very true that like your body wants to be at a healthy set point. Mm -hmm. And if it's, if you're often, like if you're working through chronic pain, if you're working through autoimmune these are, these are a lot healthier decisions. It's yeah. not necessarily your classic, like, all right, I need to like eat this many calories and eat this many macros and do this style of workout, but they're healthful behaviors that if you are, if you are overweight, you've got quite a bit to lose. Like you said, not like you're five, 10 pounds, maybe yeah. you're going to, you're going to see some changes in your body composition. It's just, it may not be the fastest. It may not be what you want, but it is going to pull you in that right direction as well. Exactly. And it also makes, once you get to that optimal health state, it becomes so much easier to lose weight at that point and look a certain way than if you go the other way around. I was going to say the other way around. I mean, more than likely, like losing body fat is just, it's mean, it's mean to your yeah. body. Like it was mean to put us there in the first place. It's mean to bring us back down. It, I mean, it's hard. And if you haven't quite figured out the source of your chronic pain, haven't figured out your autoimmune quite yet, it's only going to lead to more flare-ups. Your body's going to rebel a lot more and you're less likely to stick with it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. 
Cool. So I want to get into your beliefs on training because this is, this was fun for us. Uh, we really connected on this. So how do you define functional training and movement? Yeah. So let's define functional movement first. So functional movement are our body's natural movement patterns that when we're born, we're really designed to be able to do. And so my favorite example is when a child plays or a baby plays, they sit in that really deep squat position, like almost with their butt to the ground. You know, they can stay there for a really long time, very comfortably, you know, their chest is up, you know, knees are forward, their butts all the way down and they can just play there right in front of them. And if you are not used to doing functional training, try doing that as an adult. It, one, good luck getting down there. Two, good luck staying there comfortably for more than like a few seconds. Do you ever, do you ever use infant squats with your clients? I do. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, um, we went through a phase where we used a lot of infant squats in our programs and uh-huh. they were not very happy. So thank you for bringing up the, <laughs> you for bringing this up. This, like, yeah. Rewind everyone. Listen to it again. She said it. It's not just me. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's so important. It's so important. I mean, I have people sit in that, just in that position for long periods of time, squat and scroll, you know, just sit in that position, watch TV, do whatever you want. Cause I want to get your body more comfortable with this position Yeah. and training to get down there is so valuable. And so, so these functional movements are things that we were born with and that we've lost a lot of times from, you know, our daily lifestyle from sitting a lot, being on our computer, sitting in front of your phone, you know, working all these things. So functional training is really designed to help you get back to a lot of these natural movement patterns and strengthen those proper movement patterns that ultimately lead us to less or no pain. Yeah. I think like one of my big ways to define it, like I'm going to help you get off the toilet I'm going to help you grab that item from the top shelf. I'm going to help you pick up that box, that laundry basket or box off the floor because those are natural. Like it it truly to me, I love every single person that I work with. I don't care how much you you squat or how much you bench press. Like I really care that you can still pick things up off the floor and grab things off the shelf because like independence is valuable and nobody wants to lose that earlier than, uh, than they should. So, and it can go away really quick. I have a senior fitness specialty. And so I've worked with a lot of people, you know, in advanced age. And I mean, being able to carry in their groceries to be able to reach behind them and put on a jacket, a shirt. I I mean, it's something you don't think about until you're like, I can't reach my arm behind me to put it through a jacket. You don't want to lose that. Yeah. I, I'm laughing because I had a client who, um, she grabbed her laptop. She's going to know when she watches this she grabbed her <laughs> laptop from the back seat and, uh, her, her back kind of tweaked out on her and she was, she came in, she's like, I'm not feeling too happy, but I felt like I did need to move my body. I mean, heck, like we just modified, did the right things. And she felt way better when she left, but, um, she just laughed. She's like, I can't believe I'm not old enough for this. I'm like, it happens. Like it, it totally happens, but it's like, they're very valuable skills that like you want to be, I mean, I look at me and like, I want to carry all the groceries in, in one trip. (laughs) Yes. I can't imagine losing that skill because I don't want to make multiple trips out there when it's cold, rainy, whatever, weather, hot too. I mean, I don't want to do that. No, no, no. And, and little things too. I mean, for, for younger people, I mean, I work with a lot of moms and to be able to pick your child up off the ground, out of the crib. I mean, it is devastating when some of these moms come to me and they're like, I can't pick up my six month old. Yeah. And, and it, it is heartbreaking. And, and it's, you're, you're right. I mean, it's so valuable and you don't realize how special it is until you lose it. Yeah. Yeah. So how does functional training differ from HIIT training, CrossFit, Olympic lifting, powerlifting, all those really nice and gentle activities. <laughs> yeah. So we have a lot of performance things in there. So if we think like CrossFit, powerlifting, uh, you know, these are sports, 
these were really not designed for the average person. You know, a CrossFit workout, you know, if we look at a CrossFit athlete, they might do two workouts in a day and then literally their entire rest of the day is all about recovery. Their sleep, what they're putting in their bodies, you know, sauna, cryotherapy, massage therapy, manual manipulation. I mean, all of their entire life revolves around recovery and training. We get the average person here who they're working, you know, eight to 10 hours a day. They have a family, they have a social life. They're sleeping seven hours. If they're pretty lucky eating a very, we'll say even a decent diet, not a standard American diet, but a decent diet, that person has no business doing CrossFit. Once again, powerlifting is a sport. It is not designed for the average high stress individual. And, and I'm going to get to hit training in a minute, but these sport things, I, we're just not, the average person can't spend enough time in recovery to be able to perform like people are being pushed to yes. in these specific things. Yes. Yeah. I know. Like, if, I mean, for me as a power lifter, like there was a point like business wise, I had to, I had to say like, right now it's more important that I focus on business growth and like, I need to be the best employee, the best boss I can be. So that means that my powerlifting is going to suffer a little bit. I don't have as much time to dedicate to it. Yeah. Um, and that's what I think that we, we forget, like we don't have endless hours and it's, you can't just like add more things in to get better results. Like right now, I know this is, this is crazy. Powerlifter training for a triathlon here. Okay. I'm, I'm absurd. I am absolutely crazy, but like my recovery has like absolutely skyrocketed. I have taken down two training days, taken off two accessory training days for powerlifting. I mean, my recovery is like, I'm spending 30, 45 minutes on recovery work every single day. And it's like, it's still a lot. I'm like, I cannot wait for this to be done because like, I genuinely, I'm like, I don't have time for these things. Yeah. But we, recovery like, is a full-time job. Yes. Like I work, like I work in the business, like I have the phone mower next to me almost all day long. And I'm so lucky that I do there. I would have no business doing this if I, if I was in any other profession. So I'm very fortunate that way, but it's like, I, I have the ability to prioritize both. It's, it is a full-time gig because hot diggity damn. I mean, it's like, it's a lot. Like I have 90 minutes for biking and running today. That's like 90 minutes too much of anything. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. It's, I, it really is. And I, you know, I talk about this with a lot of my clients too. It's, you know, for me, my recovery is so important and I'm not even, you know, like I said, I get, I, ha I have three days a week, about an hour and 15 minutes at most where I can train, strength train. That's all my body allows. And I do, five to six days of 30 to 40 minutes in the sauna. I do a whole fasting day just to reduce my inflammation. I take a whole bunch of products and do a bunch of things for that. Not to be too graphic, but I do like coffee and enemas every week to do, you know, focus on my liver detox. I rebound every day. You know, I sleep eight to eight and a half hours a day. I make 99% of my own food from scratch. You know, I meditate once to twice a day, every single day, seven days a week. And it, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I think like, I love that you just laid out everything that you do. Cause I don't, I definitely don't do that often enough as a coach. I think it's like, it's, it's undervalued and it's underappreciated. Do you have a sauna in your house? I do. I have a portable infrared sauna. So I had one of the root causes of my inflammatory issues was heavy metals. Hmm. I had crazy levels, crazy high levels of aluminum in particular. And so for me to be able to it get those out. Sweating was so important. Um, and dealing. So I'm now working on hormonal balances and the liver. I mean, my appreciation for the liver as an organ is just like so high. And so it's so undervalued in our society and sweating. And most people can't detox super well. And I am one that's on the lower end of being able to detox by myself. So I have to have these tools readily, readily available for me. Cool. Cool. I like that. Um, yeah. Sana's like, I got, I have to get more comfortable with them. I'm like, I don't like being warm. So when I, 
what? I'm like, what? It's like a panic. I'm like, I have to like do like a, like a sauna meditation. I'll never forget. We went uh-huh. like, we were in a sauna at some resort with some of my family and they're like, are you okay? I was like, no, no. <laughs> Having one where you can control it is a whole lot better and you can slowly work your way up. I mean, I started a pretty low level temperature and I'm now, I mean, I go up to about 155 and I'm in there for about 30 or 40 minutes, very consistently. Hmm. Cool. I like that. Mm-hmm. Um, let's get to the hit training. Let's yeah. just, just like go right at it. Yeah. So um, no one should ever be doing hit training unless they, once again, are an athlete or use very, very strategically. And your body has to be so primed and in such a good place that you can do it temporarily for short periods of time. And it is, HIIT training is not a 30 minute workout. It is not a 40 minute workout. It is like a four to 20 minute workout. And 20 minutes is a long time if you're doing it right. I was going to say, if you're doing it correctly, it's like, it's really, really hard. And I think like the industry has totally tainted what it means to do HIIT training. Um, and I'm guilty. I like, heck, like I opened a gym and I was scared to do anything different because hit, hit classes sold. So I ran HIIT classes, even though everything inside of me was like, this is so bad. This is so bad. Um, I love you all. Sorry, I put you through it, but we've changed. We've changed our ways. I, I grew some confidence and was like, no more, no more. Yeah, I was, I got trained to teach a hit class that was 30 minutes long. That was not good for people. It was definitely led to some of my own health issues, led to many of my clients' health issues. And, you know, if we think about women, I have yet to meet a female client who doesn't have HPA access issues of some sort. So that's hypothalamus, adrenal, pituitary issues. And that deals with cortisol and stress. And most people have done a lot of HIIT style workouts or these high intensity cardio based workouts. And if you're doing weights with no breaks, that is also a cardio workout. And if you are pushing yourself very intensely, this is more of a HIIT style workout and it, the body cannot handle it. I mean, it's the same thing with, you know, this CrossFit more performance, you know, sport based things. And our bodies have a, a a very finite amount of energy that it can handle. And when we're not sleeping, not eating well, have a ton of stress. And then we add these workouts on workouts are a stressor and they can be a positive stress or a very, very negative stress. And HIIT style workouts are a very negative style stress. Unless you are, your body is in such a good place where you can incorporate little bits, little bits yeah. of HIIT training. Yeah. I know like it's sometimes challenging for somebody who's coming into our space to see like, so like you still, like you still run time sets. I'm like, yes, we still run time sets. However, like you're not going to do the same exercise twice. I mean, it's not going to be back to back. There are like, we have rep goals and like it's specific to the time set. Like if it's 30 seconds, your goal is eight to 10 reps. Like it's very specified. It's your best way to run a strength training program in a group, in a group class. Yeah. But it's like, once you do it, you're like, wow, like, I don't feel like I'm going to tip over doing this (laughs) goblet squat because I'm absolutely fried out. Um, you know, it's paired with some other complementary exercise that allows the muscles to recover and get a break. Hit style training, true hit style training. It's like beat down, beat down, beat down, beat down move on to the next exercise, repeat. Yeah. You shouldn't need a nap after your workout. Mm -hmm. You should feel very refreshed and rejuvenated. You also shouldn't feel like the workout is the only place where your body feels good and energized because that means you are now getting your only cortisol spike during your exercise and you are crashed throughout the rest of the entire day. And that exercise piece, which is almost always hit training, is part of the problem. Yeah, for sure. Um, so in your opinion, what are some of the pros to functional movement, functional training? Yeah. I mean, all, all of them. 
it is the best. I, I, you know, if we think about longevity, if we think about health, if we think about being pain free, um, and being able to, to enjoy our movement and our life long term, well into our advanced age years, functional training is the best thing to do as the foundation of your program. And just, I mean, our daily life is not designed around functional movements. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, we, we do most of everything in front of us. Uh, You know, we don't twist and turn and rotate, do things behind us and, and move side to side. And so our life isn't designed around this and, but our bodies were meant to move like this. And so having functional training and, and making sure we keep all of these movements helps make sure that we don't have pain can help fix pain, but also ensures that we don't get more pain long-term. And then also for optimal health, it's just functional training is so good and restorative for the body. Yeah. So out of respect, we got to like water some of the cons. <laughs> we got to go there. So I, you know, the biggest con that I see is, is functional training going to get you the best way to your aesthetic goal? Maybe not a hundred percent. Should it be the foundation for sure? But, you know, at, at a certain point, once again, if our health is there, there are other strategies that we can definitely implement that are going to allow us to get to a more aesthetic goal than, than just functional training. And once again, that's not to say that functional training shouldn't be the foundation, but you know, there are a lot of other techniques that we can use to get us to a little bit more of an aesthetic goal, um, an advanced aesthetic goal, I would say, not just like a baseline, but a more advanced aesthetic goal. I was, I would say it's like, it's not the sexiest thing out there. It's, no. You know, like hit is sexy because it like sounds totally badass, but like, Hey, like I'm going to teach you how to carry in all your groceries a little bit better. <laughs> it's not sexy like it it, it's like it's sexy when you're 70 yeah (laughs) when you're not 70 you're like awesome like thanks for that I can do that like I can do that now um that's one of the big ones that I say too yeah yeah that's that's very true I I it is very sexy to me because I think health is super sexy (laughs) yeah Yes. I mean, we're we're more attractive as people when we're healthy too. I I mean, there's, there's research showing that if we are biologically healthy, we are more attractive to other people. Yes. So, but yeah, it is not the most fun always to do long-term and forever. I mean, go back to infant squats. Like who wants to be, who wants it pointed out that like, you cannot drop your butt down to the floor. Like it, it points out more of your faults, which is great but not like, you're like, man, like, I feel like I totally sucked into this workout because I like couldn't, I couldn't move that way. It's like, it's normal. It happens. Yeah. And I also think there's, and if you come from a sports mindset, you know, the concept of not being good at something and then getting good at something is really cool. And, and I think experimenting with different styles of training like that. And I I've done this and it's, you got to really check your ego And, but that's also fun because when you start to get good at something and you're like, I can sit in that real deep squat for 10 minutes and feel good doing it. You're like, I couldn't even get down here three months ago. So I think, I think kind of having that perspective of, of always wanting to learn, always wanting to better yourself helps make functional training a little bit, a little bit more fun. For sure. So in a world where we're heavy on this belief that more calories burned always results in more fat loss, how do you approach that with clients and help them see that less is actually more? Yeah. So I always start with the health thing. Super into optimal health, if you can't get that right now. I would have never asked. (laughs) So functional health and foundational health is, I mean, it should be the basis of everything that we do. So being at eating 1200 calories a day long-term is not the best for health because realistically, we can't get all of our nutrients in 1200 calories a day. Yeah. Oh, imagine that. (laughs) Yeah. So the other part that I like to talk about is when we talk about cardio versus more of, of 
any sort of traditional strength training. And I'd include functional training in that too. You know, cardio, you're going to burn a certain amount of calories in that moment, which is great. So let's say you start to go run and you go run for 30 minutes twice a week. You're going to burn calories. Okay. Well, your body's going to get used to that in about two weeks, if not a little bit sooner. So then you have to up it. Do you have infinite amount of time in your life to continuously increase the amount of time that you run to keep getting to your weight loss goal? Most of us know. Also, who wants to be running for multiple hours a day, every single day for the rest of your life? That sounds like the worst thing. That's like pure torture in my eyes. <laughs> and like in training for this triathlon, 110%, it's awful. Yeah. It's awful. Yeah, I can't even imagine. Um, so there's that aspect. Now, if we think about resistance training and we're training smarter, we're burning probably sometimes less calories than we would during a traditional cardio workout. However, you can always change resistance training. Your body's going to adapt just the same, but we can also change the way you train essentially forever and always keep your body guessing. You, you get to eat more because your base metabolic rate, the number of calories that you naturally burn in a day is going to increase. Science has a specific number from my personal experience. It's a lot more than that. You know, I've taken people from 1400 calories to 2,500 calories, and they are maintaining or losing at 2,500 calories a day, you know, just with some strength training. Yeah. And, and that's pretty incredible that our bodies can adapt like that. And, and science would probably not say the exact same thing that we can get to that place, but I've, I've seen it so many times that, it, it's real. I mean, that's a, it's a real thing. And it's really not just about your calories in calories out. It's, there are other ways to change how our body works, how our, our metabolism, you know, is never broken to the point where we can't restore and put our bodies into once again, a good place of optimal health plus more than that. And so it's calories. Yes. Are super important. Nutrition is super important health first for sure. But if we're smart with our training, there's so much that we can do with nutrition where we can fuel the body, feed the body, and that's going to make your body a whole lot happier. And if you want to lose weight long-term, which is a stressful thing on the body, we need to get to a place where we're not continuously just stressing the body by starving it. Yeah. I think that's like, that's huge. Isn't that we always want to apply more stress. And we always like it. We were told calories in, calories out for how long? Forever. It was like hit hit training is the way to lose body fat. It's just it's we got to reprogram that thought process. Yeah. And I mean, I have, I have plenty of clients who like we've gone through like a, a recomp, and you bring them up to maintenance level calories, and as they eat more and they continue to lose weight, they're like, "What? I don't understand. Like, how is this happening?" And I'm like because your, your body's hungry. Like, yeah. it's like, Oh my God, thank you so much for doing this to me. Like, It's your body wants food. It needs fuel. You know, I like, I love that people think like I eat 2,900 calories a day and they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, yeah. And like, I know that the summer is a little bit different in my, like my cardio output is way higher than what it was which is probably why I'm eating 2,900 calories right now. Right. But at the same time, it's like, it, like I can still eat 2,500 calories and not gain any weight. I mean, if depending on where I'm at in preparation for a meet and if I need to cut any little bit, like I can eat 2000 calories and cut pretty quickly and it's, it's not too big of a deal. And people are like, they're shocked. Um, it's like mind blowing to them that you can eat more food mm -hmm. and still lose body fat and look better. And then you're going to feel better and your body's happier because it's actually getting real nutrients and you're yeah. eating real food. And uh, yeah, it, it's such a big difference. And there's such a smarter way to go about body recomposition than just starving yourself. Yes. Yes, Absolutely. Cool. Well, anything else to add from you? 
I think that's it. I, you know, if you want more information, um, I've got a YouTube page. I'm under Megan, the trainer, um, under all of my stuff. Um, so I'm on YouTube, Instagram, and then chronic pain solutions of my Facebook group, where we talk all about, you know, fixing chronic pain inside and out. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for being here. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. It was great to talk to you again.